joke, me gotta go, me oh my oh. Me gotta go pull down the road, get down the fire. My Yvonne, the sweetest one, me oh my oh. Son of a gun, we'll have good fun on the bio. Jambalaya and a crawfish bar, filet gumbo. Cause tonight I'm gonna see my share of me oh. Pick guitar, fill a fruit jar, and be gay 
Mississippi We'll take a boat To the land of dreams Steam down that river Down to New Orleans A band there to meet us Old friends to greet us You'll see the place Basin Street Basin Street Is the street Where all good friends Always meet And do all things The land of dreams You'll never know How good it seems Or just how much it really means Yes, sirree Glad
Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans? And that's where the night and day. I know I'm not wrong. The feeling's getting stronger the longer I stay away. Miss the moss covered vine and tall sugar pines where mockingbirds used to sing. Hurry down to New Orleans, oh yeah. The moonlight on the bayou, a Creole tune that fills the air. I dream about the loneliness in June, and now I'm wishing I was there. Do you know what it means? To miss you Orleans When that's when you lift your heart There's something more I miss the one I care for More than I miss you Orleans Give me that ball Welcome to February Jazz Sanctuary, where we're reflecting on God with us as jazz party. We're going to have other announcements and other things later, but just a couple quick ones. First, if you need the restroom, uh, you'll notice the sign here. You're going to go down this pew, round about through that door, and the bathroom's on the right-hand side. So it's over there, should you need it. D Tim will model the behavior at some point for all of you and how, how, how to make it happen. Uh, in addition, wait, I need the other thing. Hang on. Da, 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 da. Tablets, this one. Uh, we're going to do uh, introductions in a couple different places, but I'm going to start out today for the first time ever. You are now seeing our new Acting Out the Scriptures Theater troupe. And with us today, in alphabetical order, are Charlotte Bell, Carrie Ho, Celeste McQuarrie, David Nelson, and Tim Wildman, and myself. So we will be doing that shortly. We're going to start with scripture after one more, our, one more song. And then we're going to, a very important song. We're going to bring us all into our jazz party. Beat up, bop, 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 ba da da ba Key change. <laughs> Jazz party till the break of dawn. We're 
made available to everyone who believes in him. But the Spirit had not yet arrived because Jesus had not yet been glorified. This man is definitely a prophet! This is God's anointed, the liberated king! <laughs> is it possible for the anointed to come from Galilee? Don't the Hebrew scriptures say that he will come from Bethlehem, King David's village, and be a descendant of King David? Rumors and opinions about the true identity of Jesus divided the crowd. Some wanted to arrest him, but no one dared to touch him. The officers who had been sent by the chief priests and Pharisees to take Jesus into custody returned empty-handed, and they faced some hard questions. Where is Jesus? Why did you capture him? We listened to him. Never has a man spoken like this man. So you are also the minister. Can you find one leader or educated person who believes this man? Of course not. This crowd is plagued by ignorance about the teachings of the law. That is why they listen to him. This is also why they are under God's curse. Nicodemus. The Pharisee who approached Jesus under the cloak of darkness earlier to understand more about him was present now when the officers returned empty-handed. He addressed the leaders. Does our law condemn someone without first giving him a fair hearing and learning something about him? Really? <laughs> Are you from Galilee too? Look it up for yourself. No real problem. 
that you're supposed to come from Galilee. Scene! these opening words from Chris Rose of New Orleans. Mardi Gras is the love of life. It is the harmonic convergence of our food, our music, our creativity, our eccentricity, our neighborhoods, and our joy of living all at once. Uh, uh. <laughs> Some of you here may be familiar with the uh, United Church of Christ's uh, daily devotional, which comes out um, in the mornings uh, each day, and it has some wonderful material. And one of the many uh, excellent writers is Mary Ludy. And uh, this particular one came out on February 7th, and it's called Eating with the Physician. The Pharisees were complaining to his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus says he's come to call sinners to repentance. But there's no sign in this passage that he's thinking, Oh good, I can bag some souls at supper. There's no judgment after all, breast beating. The only, there's, no, there's no judgment, altar call, sorry, or breast beating. The only people he actually corrects are the righteous. Jesus knows that tax collectors aren't morally well. He also knows that sick people need healing, not shaming. 
And the key to healing is company, solidarity, friendship, intimate presence, like the intimacy of sharing a meal. That's why he's there, to be with them and to eat with them. Sometimes I wonder what would happen if we understood our presence and sharing of food at the table as a gift to someone who needs to know that their sins do not make them undesirable to Jesus or to us. If we understand others' presence and sharing as an offer of healing, we ourselves badly need. If we welcome Jesus into our midst just to be with us, to eat and enjoy life with us, and didn't turn every occasion with him into a moralistic moment, a lesson to be learned, an obligation to shoulder. I wonder too what it would be like if when we gather for communion, there actually were no notorious public sinners among us. And I wonder what might need to change in our practice of communion such that righteous people would be scandalized by it and ask us incredulously, why? Let us pray. Call us to repentance, good Jesus, so that we will be happy among tax collectors and sinners. All of us eating and drinking our way to healing. All of us eating and drinking our way to God. Amen. This morning with my mind I'm so glad to see all of you here today, and I'm so glad to he see all of you here today online. Um, it's a joyous celebration, and uh, what we're about today is uh, embodying that celebration is part of life, too. Uh, and goodness knows we all could use some celebration after the last couple of years. And um, 
It is our belief that God is with us as much when we celebrate as, he, as God is with us when we do everything else. So today is about joy and community and laughter and uh, loudness. <laughs> so uh, we're so grateful to have uh, all the people that we have here today to help us be loud, and I'll be introducing some of us loud people in just a minute. But before we do that, um, we're delighted to have someone come back to us who uh, was here once before, but that was when we were doing our jazz sanctuaries remotely. One day we gathered in Fran Irvin's backyard, a beautiful June day, I believe. Uh, Fran's with us here today. She has the most beautiful backyard in Concord, I think. And uh, we did something on the jazz of creativity called Creating from the Middle. And during that time, uh, we were joined by today's guest, uh, Inez McDermott. Inez is the professor of art history at New England College. And today we've asked her to come and talk with us a little bit about some of the art of Carnival or Mardi Gras and also just of human celebration. Inez? So Tim, when Tim asked me to, um, to talk about images of celebration and Mardi Gras, I thought, oh, no problem. I'll just find some images. Well, I have to tell you, there are very few paintings of images of Mardi Gras. Um, however, I have found some. We're going to go back in history a little bit. But I also wanted to talk about a contemporary artist as well, and also look at some early 20th century artists who kind of resonate, with, at least with the theme of jazz. But before I do that, I just wanted to remind us what Mardi Gras looks like. Um, I think most of us know New Orleans images. I think when we think Mardi Gras, we think of New Orleans. Um, we think of Rio de Janeiro, um, Carnival in Rio de Janeiro, but Dakar, Marseille, you know, cities across the world celebrate Mardi Gras, Carnival, which is the same, basically means the same thing. Um, culminating with um, Tuesday, the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, before Lent starts. Um, here's the huge one in Rio, which apparently I just read as being postponed to April this year, probably, I assume because of COVID. And Venice. Venice, I think when we think historically, I think we think of Venice as the um, site of what is the raucous celebration that we now think of New Orleans. I think Venice in its day um, was the New Orleans <laughs> of, of Mardi Gras then. Um, and one of the, there are a couple of aspects as, I'm, as I was doing a little bit of research and thinking about this, about Mardi Gras, about the, uh, the uh, beginning of Lent. And there are a couple of themes that keep coming up. One is the theme of, um, of identity, of masking your identity, of, of taking on a different persona. Um, another one is the theme of food and um, starting to um, restrict the excesses of life. So, you know, as Carnival is to celebrate all of these excesses, um, Lent is to restrict yourself. Um, so I wanted to look at some of the ways that these themes kind of run together in, in some of the art that we, um, we're going to look at today. So going back, looking at Mardi Gras celebrations, Mardi Gras in New Orleans starts in the late 19th century. Um, and these are some designs. This is kind of the art of Mardi Gras that you find from New Orleans, these designs for um, floats and costumes that um, well-known artists were commissioned to design for the various crews and, and the um, you know, various celebrations of Mardi Gras. I was reading about the way that the uh, white population would have balls. They'd have costume balls and they would be inside and there would be um, uh, orchestras that played waltzes and things like that, where the black and Creole population would be outside with all the good music, right? <laughs> so <laughs> eventually what happens is the white population goes out into the streets and joins the rest of the New Orleans population. I thought that was fascinating. And so, and it really speaks to the, the power of jazz and what jazz is, at least to me, is this combination of all these cultures and musical traditions coming together. 
but I love this. And this was, if you see, it was uh, the missing links theme, which is fascinating, and it was making fun of Darwin. This whole um, sort of float and, and crew doing nothing but satirizing Darwin and what he was saying, and it was apparently incredibly racist, and it even got stopped and wasn't allowed to cross the river and all kinds of things. But these kinds of designs are really wonderful. I've, I um, only had room to put one in, but um, they're worth looking up at some point. If you just Google Mardi Gras drawings, you'll, they'll pop up and you'll find some really interesting articles about them. But it's, again, it's this idea of dressing up as someone else, as taking on another persona that we see starting at Mardi Gras early on in, in New Orleans. Um, there's an artist, unfortunately, this, um, the color didn't come out quite so well in this projector, but um, there's an ar a contemporary artist today whose name is Nick Cave. He is an African-American artist who grew up in the South and does what he calls sound suits. I'll just uh, focus on that one. He's inspired by Mardi Gras. He's inspired by the costumes of Mardi Gras. He also talks about the way that he sees these costumes as a way to hide yourself, to not be vulnerable. As a black man who's responding to what's happening in the world, to especially to black men, he um, started to think about the way that these suits could be worn without your identity being revealed. He calls them sound suits because they move a lot and they make a lot of noise. And the, um, the sound he talks about sort of you know, making noise in the world, but making noise in a way where no one's going to attack you, right? No one's going to question you because you are in this celebratory costume. And many of them look like, especially the first one that I showed you, well, even these, they very much look like kind of, if you ever see the pictures of the streets of New Orleans after Mardi Gras parade, they kind of look like all the stuff that he's gathered up and used to, to create these suits. So I think my, my thinking is, in terms of an artist who is making work about Mardi Gras right now, to me, he is the artist who's directly responding to that. So to go back a little bit, as I mentioned, two themes. Changing identity and food. So <laughs> the Franz Halls, which is on the right, shows Shrovetide revelers. Shrovetide meaning Fat Tuesday, the day that people eat pancakes and get ready for the, um, the restrictions of Lent. And it's hard to see, but uh, the red cheeks and red noses of these revelers show that they've been drinking a lot. They've got um, a lot of food and drink in their hands. And the interesting thing is the, what looks like the young woman in the front is actually a man who's dressed up as a woman. The themes of cross-dressing, of taking on um, another gender, is something that we see celebrated and explored throughout um, images of, of Carnival as well. The one on the left, John Molinar, the battle between Carnival and Lent. It's a little hard to see. The figures on the right are monks and they are fighting with townspeople. And what, the, what they're fighting with are spears that are full of fish and, <laughs> and the foods of Lent, which tend to be things like pretzels or um, you know, dry bread and things like that. The townspeople have um, pork and you know, big pieces of meat and things like that. So, <laughs> and it's also, I mean, look at the vertical um, definition, right? On the left-hand side are the, uh, the bad people, right? The townspeople who are reveling and having a lot of fun, and on the right-hand side are the monks. It's always the left that's the, the evil side, which <laughs> as a lefty I really take exception to, but it's almost always the case. But here you really see that food theme here. This is um, uh, a print from 1580 of Carnival and, and Lent. This is Quaresima, which means 40 days, which is the period of Lent. Um, so I don't know how well you can see, but the hat that um, Carnival is wearing is full of sausages and meats, and the hat that Quaresima is wearing is full of fish and corn and vegetables and things like that. So again, that reminder. <laughs> 
This idea of a battle is something that we continue to see in early art too. This is a um, 16th century um, image of carnival and Lenten carts. And again, I'm sorry, it's so hard to see, but an image of carnival is being pulled in on the left and Lent on the right. And in the middle, they're, um, the townspeople are all battling. And again, food is involved here as well. I'll show you a better image of um, Bruegel's um, uh, replication of sort of this whole idea. This is the Battle of Carnival and Lent. In the foreground, do you see the man in blue? He's sitting on a giant beer ba uh, barrel. He's, he's got a hat on his head that's made of a meat pie. It's got the legs of a crow or some kind of chicken sticking out of it. He's got a pork chop that is stuck to the top of the um, end of the barrel with a big knife. He's got a soup pot that he's using as a stirrup. Um, and he's followed by a man in yellow, which is uh, yellow was a symbol of um, Oh, uh, un untruthfulness, I guess you could say. Um, and so on the left-hand side is Carnival, and he's got a spear that's got a pig's head on it. And on the right, the woman in blue is represented as kind of this emaciated, she looks like a nun or something like that. And she has a beehive on her head, which was a symbol of the church at the time. And she's got a long paddle with, that has fish on it. Um, a, a monk and a nun are carrying her on this cart, pulling the cart. There are some pretzels, um, some bread, and some um, pancakes here. There's a bowl of mussels there. And um, she's surrounded by children, and all of them have um, the symbol of Ash Wednesday on their forehead. So it's very clearly this battle between you know, this is, this is the meeting of Fat Tuesday and Ash Wednesday. And it's all around food in the foreground, except if you look at the bigger picture, and typical of Bruegel, if you know any of his work, he often has just the life goes on. And you see these images in his paintings that um, many from the scripture. So you see the... Um, crucifixion of Christ and nobody's watching. Or you see the um, Icarus falling from the sky and nobody's watching. It's about how life goes on when momentum events are happening. But here, he also has this left-right opposition. The people on the left are all reveling. There's somewhere in there is a musician who's throwing up, for those of you who are musicians. <laughs> Reference to music there. Um, the church is on the right. On the left are beggars and peasants who are going hungry. On the right are um, people who are leaving the church and feeding the peasants and the beggars. Bruegel isn't saying, he's not passing judgment on any of these people. He's just showing us what is, right? During Lent, we pay more attention to these things. During Carnival and the rest of the year, we don't. Um, there's all kinds of symbolism in here that's just absolutely fascinating. Um, I just wanted to point out two things. So here's, here's the left, which shows a very you know, well-fed <laughs> musician here, and this person behind them carrying um, waffles or pancakes or something like that that are going to be eaten. And then this is the entrance to the church, where um, during Lent, apparently, the, um, the sculptures, the statues, were covered with um, shrouds during the 40 days of Lent. And then someone is sitting here apparently collecting money so that if you wanted to touch one of the relics in the church, you would be able to pay for that. So those are just some details that, um, that I wanted to show you from this. And we could, we could talk about this forever, but um, there's just all kinds of stuff going on um, in this painting that makes reference to that, that battle, right? That, that um, coming up against that, um, that moment that um, we're sort of asked to think about what we're willing to sacrifice and to celebrate like crazy right before we do. Um, another work that I wanted to make reference to, and, and it's interesting, the reading 
that you read today, Tim, I almost put a different painting in here of the um, Feast in the House of Levi, which is Christ eating with the tax collectors. But I, I chose this one instead. Um, and this is by an artist named Veronese, who lives in Venice. So we're going back to that wonderful um, city that celebrated Carnival um, in a way that probably is only rivaled by New Orleans these days. And this painting tells the story of Christ going with his mother to a wedding feast and they run out of wine and he, it's his first, it's his first miracle, isn't it? He changed, thank you, good. <laughs> um, he changes the water into wine. And um, seemed a bit blasphemous. Veronese was always one of those people who was on the verge of getting called into, in fact, he did with the feast in the house of, of Levi, of being called blasphemous and you know, being punished for his, uh, his inclusion of Christ in these raucous party scenes. But this work shows Christ right in the center with people from all walks of life, right? And again, thinking about Mardi Gras, thinking about celebration and the way that Mardi Gras brings people together people who um, come from all different, um, you know, all different ethnicities, all different socioeconomic backgrounds, and they can even hide it, right, especially in Mardi Gras. Well, here there's all kinds of people who seem to be in costumes, except we know that this is Venice, and Venice was kind of the cultural center of the world, and so people from all over the world were always gathered there. Um, there are personifications of great leaders from, um, from all over Europe and from, um, from the East as well. And um, the foreground features four musicians. And Veronese has placed himself and three other famous artists as the musicians. So there's a self-portrait. This is his self-portrait. This is Titian. This is... Um, Oh, shoot. Now I can't remember their names. Two, uh, Bassano and, um, oh, sorry. I just am having a little uh, brain freeze here. But four very prominent art artists are in the personification of musicians. And the interesting thing here, again, to kind of get us back to a music theme, no one in this entire painting is talking. No one is talking to each other. The only representation of sound is the music. And the reason for that is this was placed in the refectory of the Benedictine monks. The refectory is their dining hall. And according to their tradition, they don't speak when they eat. And so no one is speaking in this, what looks like this raucous party, but the music is allowed to play. And I, I just love that idea. And the fact that the artist has decided to give himself the voice here is a really, I, I just think it's so interesting. I think there's a lot that could be explored in that. Um, I wanted to just, this is a bit of a segue, I just wanted to show you a couple of artists, African-American artists, who do celebrate music um, in a way that speaks to um, African-American culture. This is Aaron Douglas, who did a number of murals for the, um, the um, Harlem Public Library back in 1934, and he did four murals called Aspects of Negro Life. And throughout them, these are just two, the first one and the last one, um, the, African in, uh, the African in Africa and something called Song of the Towers, where this man is standing, I don't know how well you can tell, but there's a Statue of Liberty right back here. But at the center of each one of these murals is music is someone playing music. So here they're dancing and people are playing drums. And you've got this sort of talismanic figure here. And then in New York, he's with a saxophone. It's a little hard to see. With the figure of the Statue of Liberty. This consistency of music. And most of Aaron Douglas's work makes reference to music. He illustrated a lot of religious um, treatises as well with um, with prints that, that made reference to music, too. I should, I'll show them to you someday. And this one of my favorite artists, Archibald Motley, who was from Chicago. 
and did a lot of these um, street life and interior scenes of, um, of people enjoying themselves with, with music. And this idea of joyous celebration, while it's not of, of Mardi Gras in New Orleans, I think that it has that kind of aspect of people coming out and being together, all different kinds of, uh, all different kinds of people. Um, and you know what, I think I'm just gonna stop there. I could, I could go on, and I told Tim I was gonna talk for 45 minutes, and he got a little <laughs> upset with me. So, <laughs> so I think I'll stop there. I think I've given you a, a couple of images to look at throughout history, and um, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> thank you, Inez. So that was wonderful, Inez. It ties right in to what we're doing today and what we hope to, uh, the simple message we hope to get across, which is that uh, celebrating together is um, an aspect of what is given to us as a gift to do. And uh, the kind of dualism about God's in the church but not in the Mardi Gras uh, is something we hope to give, to, give the lie to today. Uh, so you've really helped us with that, thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to introduce some of the rest of the folks who are here today um, being part of this uh, celebration and making noise. First of all, the noise crew back there. We have uh, our old friend uh, Chuck Booth, who's on congas, and who also designed the portable drums that uh, our drum section came in with and will go out with. Uh, yay, yeah, yeah, Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> Eddie Raska, the most spiritual drummer on the planet. Um, great friend. He and Jock and I have uh, been part of, with Amelia of the band from the beginning, almost uh, seven years ago, and uh, Eddie just will knock your socks off on the drums. Thank you, Eddie. Next to Eddie uh, in the back, um, the guy who does everything, he plays bass, he produces all this, he is our technology integrator, he puts everything on YouTube, he never sleeps. Um, and. Uh, uh, Jock and I have been musical friends forever, and uh, his dad, Frank, was one of my oldest and dearest friends and colleagues, Frank Irvin. This is Jock Irvin. <laughs> we are delighted today to have a newbie with us, um, and, and who is extremely courageous. Um, Annie Popinsik is our uh, pianist for uh, our church. She was on accordion today. Way to go, Annie. She's also rocking the purple boa, I might add. Yeah, it's very good. Um, over here uh, on my left um, is all the way from Brooklyn and soon to be leaving for New Orleans um, uh, on the trombone and vocal, my brother Jim Wildman. On his right, one of the world's greatest entertainers. <laughs> we just heard him last night at Hermano's. I think, uh, Joey, if you ever want to be entertained, go when Joey's playing. It's just amazing. Uh, he plays all the reed instruments, he sings, uh, and most of all, he lights up a room. Joey Placenti. <laughs> Of course, we have um, the person whose spirit and voice uh, makes it all happen and leads it all, um, vocalist and pastor, Amelia Halstead. Our tech person, uh, because Jock has to play, so we need a tech person, uh, is jazz deacon Ron Dieter. I was going to say our oldest jazz deacon, but I don't mean to say it that way. She was, she was our original jazz deacon, my wife, Carol Hovey. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> we also have uh, jazz deacon uh, Brenda, Brenda Placenti over here. Thank you, Brenda. And jazz deacon Gene Donahue right here in front. 
<laughs> the Jazz Deacon's main function is to have fun and make sure you're having fun. So that's what they do. Um, I'm Tim Wildman, and uh, again, I thank you all for coming today. Uh, a month from today, on the 20th of March, will be our next Jazz Sanctuary at 1 o'clock right here. And uh, it will be called the Jazz of Righteous Anger. And uh, looking at uh, the fact that uh, anger sometimes can be the energy of change. And we're going to be considering the, uh, the biblical passage from John where Jesus turns over the money changers' temples. And we'll have the Reader's Theater back for that. It's going to be very exciting. And also at that service, we're going to be taking in some new friends, uh, some uh, folks who are either becoming associate members or members or partners with us in our ministry, particularly our Jazz Sanctuary ministry. And uh, if you're interested in, in joining this endeavor and being with us in this ministry in whatever way you feel uh, inclined, uh, just contact Amelia or me because we're going to be having several people who are going to be joining in. You can be an associate member and still be a member of another church. Um, and, uh, and of course, you can be a partner um, and uh, just join with us in a very focused or narrow way, or you can become a full member. But get to one of us, and we'll uh, talk with you about that between now and next month. And now I'm going to give it back to Amelia. Thank you, Tim. And our final announcement uh, is just a reminder that this gift, this service is a gift to all of you, um, and we invite you to pass it on if you so choose. Um, there are offering plates on the side of the uh, sanctuary here, but you can also donate online if that's your choice. If you go to our website, conqueredsfirstchurch.org, there is a donate button right on the home page. Um, so we invite you to pass it on um, and help us continue this ministry of music and, and jazz and, and party. So... Yeah. friends, let us be together in a spirit of prayer. 
Holy God, whose spirit moved over the waters at the dawn of creation, hear our prayers today for all who thirst. We pray for those who are spiritually thirsty, who long to know your presence, but don't know where to find you. We pray for those who are alone and without hope, those who long to feel needed and loved, those who are searching for meaning and purpose. Healing river, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray for all who are physically thirsty, who don't have enough water to drink or feed their animals, whose fields are parched, whose crops have withered, those who have to walk long distances to find enough water to survive, or who have to be content with water that is unclean. We pray for these, those whose homes and villages are torn apart because of drought or famine. O healing river, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray also for those who are thirsty for justice, who long for an equal sharing of resources among peoples and nations, those who put their lives at risk to protect streams and rivers and oceans, those who are working to find clean water and make it available to all. O healing river, pour down your waters and heal your people. God, we ask that you would open our hearts to the needs of all who thirst. Give us courage to work together for justice, to stand alongside those who are thirsty, so that all people everywhere may live without want or fear and may discover the abundant life you promise to each one. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of living water, we pray. And now I invite you to join with me in the Lord's Prayer as is printed in your bulletin, which is translated by Neil Douglas Klotz. O birther, father, mother of the cosmos, focus your light within us, make it useful. Create your reign of unity now through our fiery hearts and willing hands. Help us love beyond our ideals and sprout acts of compassion for all creatures. Animate the earth within us. We then feel the wisdom underneath supporting all. Untangle the knots within so that we can mend our hearts' simple ties to each other. Don't let surface things delude us, but free us from what holds us back from our true purpose. Out of you, the astonishing fire returning light and sound to the cosmos. Amen. We're now going to move into our Agape Feast liturgy and continuing to keep everyone safe. If you would like to receive, we have communion to go. As you head out the door, it's a, a cup with gluten-free bread on one side and grape juice on the other. We shall do our liturgy. Are you prepared? I am prepared. We'll go back and forth. <clears throat> Dear friends, this is a table of welcome and all are free to come and to eat. As we gather at this table and to worship, we remember these words of our brother Jesus. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. We come to this table hungry and thirsty, seeking to be satisfied. As we gather at this table, we remember the words of our brother Jesus. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. We come to this table weary and burdened, seeking rest. As we gather at this table, we remember that Jesus comes to us in those who are strangers to us, in those who are hungry, in those who are thirsty, and in those needing warmth. We come to this table as strangers in a strange land. We ask with humble confidence that you welcome us into your family, O oh God. Please join us in, in praying the prayer of adoration. Living God, you are present in our midst and we praise you. You are tearing down walls of alienation and exclusion. For this we praise you because in Jesus, you have shown us a way of hospitality, simplicity, prayer, peacemaking, and resistance. Because your spirit makes a new path for us as we struggle to live in the shadow of doubt and fear, weak as we are, 
you fill us with hope. Lover of our souls, you give us joy, and we praise you. Amen. So we take joy together in this meal, even though we, and we invite you to, to share in your communion in your backyard, in your favorite place in your house, on top of a mountain, wherever you choose. But wherever you, we, we eat, we take joy in this meal. And even in that, we give our love and our attention to one another. And we remember that Jesus, too, is here with us. So in the midst of this sacred meal, we set three symbols to remind us of Jesus' promises to us. A candle to remind us that Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit upon us, giving us new life, new power, and new hope. We, filled with this Spirit, bring the presence of God into a broken world. And bread, for Jesus is the bread of life. He nourishes us and we put our trust in him. Grapes, a reminder of his struggle for justice and for peace, a reminder of his suffering at the hands of the Roman Empire. Jesus suffers still when the oppressed suffer injury at the hands of the powerful. Dear friends, Jesus is with us in this agape feast regardless of when you eat or how you eat it. So let us open our hearts to God and to one another as we depart from this place, knowing that we share together in the feast of love, entwined as we are by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And our benediction for today, may the Spirit and the power of the Spirit be with you. May God's strength protect you. May God's peace be with you. And I invite you now to go in the name of God, by the grace of Christ, with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But before you go, we have one more song.